may want to mute yourself, Beth. Uh oh. Janine, you can start at any time. Okay. Welcome to the 15th annual World MRSA Day and World MRSA Awareness Month webinar event. Thank you for joining us tonight. I am Janine Thomas, founder of MRSA Survivors Network and of World MRSA Day. I'm a survivor of MRSA sepsis and of C. diff. This year is also the 20th anniversary of MRSA Survivors Network, and we continue to raise awareness and educate the public and healthcare industry about the ongoing MRSA epidemic. Over 60 years ago, MRSA was first detected under a microscope by Mrs. Patricia Jones, uh, Jevons, a microbiologist in the UK. MRSA was not contained within Scotland. It spread throughout the UK to Europe and then globally. Recent U.S. hospital data has shown a 25 to 37 percent increase in MRSA infections in healthcare facilities since 2020. We are very grateful for the sacrifice that all healthcare workers made during the COVID pandemic. Due to the shortage of healthcare workers, most healthcare facilities stopped screening patients for MRSA. We must make MRSA a priority again and screen all high-risk patients. The true magnitude of this ongoing global epidemic is unknown. Many infections are underreported. So many lives have been cut short, so much pain and needless pain and suffering for decades, and with loss of income, diminished quality of life, and entire families destroyed. We must work together to do everything we can to prevent the secret and silent killer from increasing. I'm gonna now have a video from entrepreneur Richard Branson. He's also the founder of Virgin Unite and he will be giving tonight's opening remarks. Excuse us, we're having a little te technical difficulty.
in communities. Over 50% of all skin infections in, in the US that are seen by doctors are MRSA, meaning every single person is potentially at risk. As many of you that are here today have suffered from an infection or have lost a loved one, your participation in joining the movement is crucial. By sharing your compelling personal stories, others can learn about these diseases and help prevent infections. If you're not already part of it, please join the movement and become an MRSA champion in your own community, wherever you live. By supporting the efforts of MRSA Survivors Network, you have the power to make a real difference. Thank you very much. We now have our keynote speaker, Dr. William Jarvis. We are honored to have him tonight. Um, Dr. Jarvis is a world-renowned infectious disease specialist with Jason and Jarvis, and formerly with the CDC for many years. And he's going to give us a wonderful presentation tonight. Dr. Jarvis. Great, thank you. First, I'd like to thank Pat and Janine for the opportunity to speak to you today. In 2019, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, wrote a document called Antibiotic Resistance Threats in the United States. It was published in 2019. The data came from 2017, and they divided organisms that are commonly caused of healthcare-associated infections into several categories, the top category being urgent threats which included carbapenem-resistant acinetobacter, Canda aureus, Clostridioides difficile, and carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae. And then they had a group of 11 pathogens called serious threats. I won't list them all, but one of them was methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And I think it's important if we look at these numbers that in fact there are more MRSA infections, 323,700 in 2017, than there are of any of the urgent threats. And when we look at deaths caused by these organisms, 10,600 deaths caused by MRSA in 2017, and that far exceeds all but C. difficile. So really, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus certainly deserves to be in the urgent threat category with being one of the most common causes of healthcare-associated infection and causing many deaths. Next slide. If we look at a progress report published by CDC in the pre-COVID era, these are based on 2014 data. These are national summaries of healthcare associated infections in acute care facilities, and they documented that between 2008 or 9 and 2014, there was a large 50% decrease in central line associated bloodstream infections, a 17% decrease in surgical site infection related to 10 selected procedures, no change in catheter-associated UTIs, and a 13% decrease in hospital onset MRSA bacteremia between 2011 and 2014. So we saw during that period of time a decrease in many of the healthcare-associated infections. Next slide. In fact, if we look at a longer time period, again, these are data from CDC addressing secular trend in MRSA infections between 2012 and 2017. So again, in the pre-COVID era, we see that between 2012 and 2017, there was a gradual decrease in the total number of MRSA infections from about 401,000 to 323,700 in 2017 still way too many infections occurring, but at least there was a slow downward trend. Next slide. Then, as you well know, COVID-19 hit. And what we saw was that MRSA infection decreasing trend reversed. Next slide. In fact, a study done by the LeapFrog group where they compared their US hospital members, infection data that 
was collected between late 2021 and all of 2022, or what would they call the COVID period, and they compared that to the entire year of 2021 that included most of that year being pre-COVID. Their analysis found that the average MRSA standard infection ratio increased by 37%. So a substantial increase in MRSA infections occurring at these US hospitals. And in fact, hospitals in 18 out of the 50 states had a significant increase in their MRSA infection rate. Next slide. Similarly, data from CDC's National Healthcare Safety Network, or NHSN, where they looked at data from 2017 to 2020, if we look at all drug-resistant cases, we talked about the 2017 data of 3, 323,700. It increases in 2018 and bounces up a little bit more in 2019 and then decreases in 2000. 20, but if we look specifically at hospital onset cases, which is a small blue box at the bottom of each of these columns, we can see that between 2017 and 18, it stayed the same. 2019, the beginning of COVID, it increased. And in 2020, it e increased even further. Next slide. If we just look at laboratory ID MRSA bacteremia, we have over 3,000 hospitals reporting in the CDC's NHSN system. And if we look at, at the column for 2021 Q3, we see that there were over 3,000 laboratory MRSA bacteremias compared to the third quarter of 2019 when there were 1,927. So literally a 45% increase in the standardized infection ratio between the third quarter of 19 and the third quarter of 21, just in MRSA bacteremias. Next slide. This is a graphic showing a variety of healthcare associated infections. You can see the rate in terms of looking at the standardized uh, infection ratio nationally, uh, ventilator associated events increased the most as you would expect as this is during the COVID period. But second was laboratory MRSA bacteremias, which is probably somewhat reflective of MRSA infections in general. Next slide. But not all hospitals or healthcare systems had a reversal of their decreasing MRSA infection trends. Next slide. Some of you may have seen some of these data before. These are data from the Veterans Affairs or VA medical centers across the United States. And it's assessing what the impact or illustrating what the impact was of their MRSA interventions, which included active surveillance testing, culturing for MRSA, and then applying contact isolation precautions for both infected as well as colonized patients. They started this program in 2005. And as you can see in this figure with a solid blue line, each year between 2005 and 2017, the number of MRSA cases per thousand admissions decreased. Not surprisingly, they didn't have an active specific program for methicillin susceptible staph aureus or MSSA, and that rate stayed pretty much the same over this entire period of time. When they looked at MRSA infections, they decreased by 55% highly statistically significant. Their hospital onset infections decreased by 66%. Their MRSA bloodstream infections decreased by 76%. And acquisition of MRSA colonization decreased by 78%. All of these are highly statistically significant. I want you to look at this figure again and realize these are consistent data in real life at over 130 VA hospitals between 2005 and 2017, showing a consistent and sustained decrease in MRSA using this program of active surveillance testing and contact isolation. Next slide. During COVID, it provided an opportunity for the VA to study something else. 
some have argued that, well, this isn't a randomized controlled trial, and therefore it's subject to all sorts of confounding variables, and it doesn't meet the highest standard of evidence. Well, during the COVID outbreak from July 2020 to June of 2022, all of 123 U.S. Veterans Hospital acute care were given the option, a rolling option, to either suspend or to reinitiate active surveillance testing, abbreviated AST, or contact precautions for infected or colonized patients, abbreviated CPI or CPC. And then they looked at the data on those who suspended it versus not. And if we first look at ICUs, where it says yes, as IC, patients specifically in ICUs, if they use or maintain their active surveillance culture or testing, together with isolation, contact isolation of infected or colonized patients, their rate of MRSA infections was 0.2 per thousand patient days. In ICUs who did not maintain that program, the rate was 0 0.65 per thousand patient days. This was highly statistically significant, a lower rate when you used active surveillance testing and contact precautions. They also looked outside of the ICU where it says no, and outside of the ICU where they maintain active surveillance testing and contact isolation, the rate was 0 0.07, so even lower per thousand patient days, but outside the ICU where they did not maintain the, this program, the rate was 0 0.12 per thousand patient days, again, highly statistically significant. So facilities who remove their MRSA prevention practices was associated with higher MRSA HAI rates in ICUs and non-ICUs. So this, I think, illustrates that even though this is not a randomized controlled trial, it's real world experience. And it shows that if you take these prevention interventions away, the infection rate goes up. If you maintain them, they go down. Next slide, please. I think there are at least two reasons why we are not controlling MRSA infections. One is the lack of leadership, and the other are data deniers. And an example of this is that just recently, Shea, APIC, and IDSA published their recommendations for antibiotic-resistant organisms with a focus on MRSA and recommended the continuation of contact precautions but not active surveillance testing for the control of MRSA. Last, literally last week, September 23rd, in the Clinical Infectious Diseases Journal of IDSA, this opinion piece by Dr. Dykema and colleagues was published with the title, Are Contact Precautions, quote, essential, end quote, for the prevention of healthcare-associated methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus? And what they say is, we suggest that contact precautions be included among other, quote, additional approaches, but not essential approaches to MRSA prevention that can be implemented under specific circumstances, such as outbreaks or evidence of ongoing transmission, despite applicable application of the essential practices. And it's one of a small group who don't want to apply active surveillance testing and contact precautions for MRSA, despite the fact that they cannot show a decrease of the magnitude that I showed you on the VA 123 hospital data. Next slide. So in conclusion, Staph aureus, including MRSA, is the most common healthcare associated infection and a major cause of patient morbidity and mortality. After a decline in MRSA HAI rates in the pre-COVID era, MRSA rates have increased in many US hospitals. The Veterans of Air hospital system is an excellent example of the value of active surveillance testing and contact precautions on MRSA prevention and control with over 18 years of documented efficacy. There is no other study by anyone in the United States or around the world that has 18 years of documented efficacy of whatever other 
try to prevention program for MRSA they want to talk about. The failure of CDC to recommend active surveillance testing, contact precautions for infected and colonized patients, as well as SHEA, IDSA, and APIC as an essential MRSA prevention intervention, despite CDC repeatedly publishing CDC M and WRs with VA MRSA prevention data and bragging about how good it is, they don't even recommend it. And a small group of, quote, infection control, end quote, personnel who do not want to use this approach. They seriously imperil patient safety. I believe the time has come for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, to stop payment or reimbursement for MRSA HII infections. We know that they are preventable. The only way that all hospitals would take a prevention approach, as has happened with CLABSIs, for instance, is through CMS providing financial punishment. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jarvis, for your excellent presentation. Uh, we now have Ms. Uh, Ms. Beth Reimer Bias of Illinois, but tonight she's uh, coming from Indiana, and she's going to share her family's story about the loss of her baby daughter to MRSA. Beth? Yes. Hi. Thank you for this opportunity to come and share some experience and strength with you guys and hopefully bring out some awareness of some hope. Um, so here I begin with our story. I'm here to share that in the fall of 2004, after some extensive trying to become pregnant, we found out that we were pregnant with twins and we had the, both the blessing of a boy and a girl to plan and prepare for. It was a wonderful moment in our lives. Each doctor's appointment, everything seemed well. We would go, they said the babies were growing and thriving and everything seemed to be on track. In the summer, I was eight weeks early and went into premature labor. I was in the hospital for some time so they can keep me going into labor at bay. I had been there for a while and my birthday approached June 5th and I was in the hospital thinking, I wonder if my birthday present will be these two babies. Well, my husband was there and he actually was getting ready to go home and the babies had a different plan. They planned to come early. So I had to have uh, emergency C-section and they were born and they were born healthy and beautiful and they were well. They needed to go into the NICU unit and they were there for some time, but for all intents and purposes, happy and healthy and growing. And when we got them home, Everything appeared to be well. And then Maddie, she ended up developing like a cold. And uh, I noticed her breathing seemed shallow and brought her to the pediatrician. And the pedi pediatrician said that it was a viral infection and to let it run its course. So with that, we heated, went home and continued to observe her. And when we went to the doctors, that was, that was on July 9th. And on July 11th, I had woke up to proceed to have a feeding and wake both the babies up. And when I picked Maddie up, and my son's name was Luke Thomas, and her name is Madeline Renee. And this is a picture of the two of them from when they were born. So Maddie, excuse me, but on the 11th of July, I went to pick her up and her body was limp and lifeless. Every part of me to the core told me something was wrong. So we called the, and we called 911 and it seemed like forever before the paramedics got there. And they started to walk me through performing CPR on her. I remember taking her temperature and her body temperature was down to like 96.3. I had never heard of such a thing. And when the paramedics got there, they started to, explained that she was in dire straits and they brought her to a local hospital and when she was admitted they had thought maybe she had um, uh, 
I'm so sorry, excuse me. They had thought that she had a different type of infection and they're trying to do a spinal tap on her and uh, quickly learning that she needed to be airlifted because they were not equipped to take care of her. And she was airlifted to Chicago to Loyola. And uh, after being there for just a matter of a day or so, they did test results and the cultures came back that indeed it was MRSA. And this was our introduction into knowing the world of staph infections. While she was on the hospital, she was placed on life support. Uh, every single day, they would do x-rays on her. And it went in her bloodstream and attacked her lungs. And with each x-ray, her, her lungs were being riddled. And excuse me for saying, but it was like flesh-eating bacteria through my baby's lungs. And um, it just seemed like each day went on and there was nothing more they can do but put her on the same regimen of antibiotics. And um, the 22nd of July, me and my husband had been there, you know, so much. And that day, the doctors, it was complete chaos. Um, monitors were going off. It was absolutely terrifying and it seemed like her little body just could not handle anymore and um the doctors they were wonderful there's a doctor named mrs webster dr webster and she was fantastic and she helped prepare us uh, for removing her off life support and my family gathered there at the hospital and um prepared to remove her from life support. And when they did, she still fought. She still fought. She almost lived for 11 minutes. And I held her, and I share this with you, not to gain sympathy, but to understand the devastation of a super bug. And as I held her, I felt her last heartbeat in the palm of my hand. And then our family was dismantled and changed forevermore. So the next morning we get up and her twin brother, Luke, he, cause she had, she passed away. And the next morning when we got up, he seemed to be sick also and had a fever. We brought him to a local hospital and they said we needed to admit him so he could be tested. They would not test him unless he was admitted. So as I'm trying to make burial plans for the funeral, I have my son, her brother, in the NICU unit, and uh, they were supposed to test him. We went through, we had the funeral, we get him out of the hospital, and about two or three days later, the doctor's office called me, and I had asked them, did he test negative before he came home? Lo and behold, they never tested him while he was in the hospital. They never even tested him while he was there. So then we had the whole entire family tested. And at the same time, my husband was developing a boil on the outside of his hip. So he was tested. So I was colonized with it, come to find out. And I don't know if it's from my years in the healthcare industry working. Uh, I know how prevalent it is in the healthcare. But the Luke, the twin, he had it. He was colonized. My husband had it, but it was a skin infection. And then Maddie, we lost her because of this infection. We have an older son named Zachary. So out of a family of four of us, three of us had it. So, and that is when I had my introduction to Janine Thomas. And if I, I don't know what I would have done in those early days if I didn't have this passion to inform and educate and uh, many good things were happening. There was a movement that was progressing and things seemed to change. There was supposed to be the reporting. So years have gone by. I had found out in 2009 that I was going to have a daughter and she was born in April of 2009. Her name is Emma Marie. Had her, her blood sugars were, were not stable. So they brought her down to the NICU unit 
And as soon as she was admitted there, I kept asking, have you tested her? Have you tested her? And there was almost a refusal to listen. When they finally brought her back up the next day, I had repeated the question, have you tested her? And then they did and come to find out she had it also. So now out of a family of, you know, five of us to have four of us have it. Uh, it's just absolutely terrifying to me. And then with me and my search for information, you know, I had called down to the CDC and I spoke to a wonderful doctor named Mc, Dr. McDonald. And he was the one that informed me to his displeasement to things that were happening. And the reason why with the staph infection with MRSA, it's going to keep mutating. It's going to continue to mutate if we don't try to seize and control. And that's why with testing, it's so important to have them test, report, and do something to create change. Because this is scary. If we can't have children go out and play in playgrounds without, you know, getting a cut and scrape and turning into something deadly, deadly. And many people are so uninformed to this, so many. So I appreciate being able to have a platform to come and speak about our personal life experience and the strength that got us through that was having supportive people, having the MRSA Survivors Network, having other like-minded people who have endured the same thing. So I just, I pray for the continued education, knowledge, and awareness to be made. And I just thank you for all your efforts with MRSA Survivors Network, Janine Thomas. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Beth, for your very compelling and heartfelt um, story. I've known you for so many years. So, um, you know, we've been through a lot. Uh, now we are going to have Dr. John Powers. He's an infectious disease specialist and professor at George Washington University School of Medicine and at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And he's going to do a presentation today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janine. And thanks, Pat, for an, inviting me once again. Um, I, I think the way you, the order in which you put these talks is perfect. I'm going to take off and show you some more information related to what Dr. Jarvis showed. And his talk concentrated a lot on prevention. I'm going to talk a little bit more about treatments and try to get across why aren't we coming up with better treatments, which dovetails perfectly with what Beth just explained to us about types of people who get an antibiotic and still don't get better meaning we need to come up with better treatments than the ones we have. The basis for this talk is a study that we just completed in, in the Department of Defense. So you're, you're getting the all-military evening here tonight because Dr. Jarvis showed you data from the VA. I'm going to show you data from the other side of the coin, which is the Department of Defense. And the reason why both of those, those places are, are very good to evaluate this is, is that it's a, a place where you can get all the information from patients in a standardized way. So what I'd like you to focus on tonight is the burden and the outcomes in people who have Staph aureus bloodstream infections, including those due to methicillin resistant Staph aureus, and then try to take the, that information and apply it as lessons learned for both developing better treatments as well as prevention. Next slide. So when you think about it, there, the estimates of the number of different bacterial species on the earth ranges from somewhere to 30,000 to over a billion. Yet the study I'm gonna show you shows that only about two dozen of the kinds of bacteria are the kinds that really infect human beings. And up among those, Staph aureus really comes up at the top, very similar to the information that Dr. Jarvis showed you. So the, the, what we wanted to do was a study in the Department of Defense military health system, which would look at not only how many people are getting Staph aureus infections, but the really the, the equally, if not more important issue of what happens to those people? How does it affect people's lives when they get one of these infections? And then try to take that information and say, how does this evidence inform improving outcomes for the people who get these kinds of infections? Next slide. So I wanted to start off with this, just to put all of this into context. 
So if you look at this, this is a graph which actually shows the amount of money that various countries spend on healthcare and relates that on the other axis to life expectancy in years. So if you look at this, the United States spends more than the next 10 developed countries combined on healthcare. And yet if you look at our life expectancy, it's actually significantly lower than in countries like Switzerland, Germany, Canada, Britain, and Japan. So the question is, why is this? Um, is, is there an issue with something about the US healthcare system which says we're throwing a lot of money at things that aren't really helping to improve people's outcomes. Next slide. And so Michael Porter, who is a business professor at Harvard, actually wrote an excellent book called Reinventing Healthcare. His hypothesis for this is that the US healthcare system focuses more on process. That is, did you get your colonoscopy? Did you get your checkup? Did you get your vaccine? Rather than what's the outcomes of those processes and how do those processes improve people's lives? So if we talk about process and research terms, that would be things like tracking the number of infections, tracking how high resistance is, and all those things are worthwhile in and of themselves. But in the end, the reason we're tracking those things is to see how can we improve the lives of patients in the long run. So counting them up is useful only insofar as it helps us to understand how can we do better in terms of improving people's lives. So the, what Michael Porter then proposes is that the kinds of interventions that improve people's lives are the ones that are actually worth paying for. And his definition of value in healthcare then is interventions that actually improve people's lives. Next slide. So in, in terms of the infectious disease world, the Infectious Disease Society has been very vociferous of talking about a broken market for antibiotics in the United States. But the way that markets actually work is that markets are willing to pay more for better products, which improve patients' lives, much like Professor Porter said in his book. We did a study that was published in December of just last year, where we looked at the last 15 antibiotics that were approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for marketing. This was a follow-on to a study that I think I presented to your group last year where we, that we published in 2016, which looked at the 11 antibiotics that were approved between 2010 and 2016. So all in all, we looked at over a decade, the last 26 antibiotics that were approved for marketing. The interesting thing about these is that what we saw was on average, almost all of these antibiotics with rare exceptions cost between 10 and 100 times more than the older drug to which they were compared. However, ironically, not a single one of these 26 drugs actually improved patient outcomes compared to the older drug to which it was compared. So when you think about why are we in the position we are in the United States where our life expectancy isn't as good as other countries, you have to wonder why we're spending 10 to 100 times more on new drugs that don't really improve patient outcomes. This does not reflect a broken market. This reflects a market doing what it should do. And that is an unwillingness to pay for drugs that don't improve patient outcomes compared to older, better studied and less expensive drugs. New slide, next slide, thanks. So I, I just wanted to discuss with you this one study that we actually presented in abstract form at the Infectious Disease Society meetings and we're now in the process of publishing. So the design of this study was a, a retrospective study, meaning we looked backwards in time over a decade in the military health system. This is called an observational study, meaning we didn't decide which drugs patients received or which interventions they received. But then we took those people who had a bloodstream infection in the military health system and then looked forwards in time to see what happened to them. The reason we picked bloodstream infections and not all Staph aureus infections is sometimes it's very hard to determine, especially in the military, where these poor guys have stepped on explosive devices sometimes, whether the culturing of Staph aureus reflects a real infection or whether Staph aureus is going along for the ride in, in that situation. So we focused on bloodstream infections, one, because we could determine what was a real infection, and two, because as Janine said earlier, these are the kinds of people who are the sickest, and Beth's story showed this, right? In her poor baby, that, that organism had spread to the bloodstream. And those are the sickest people who also have 
um, the worst outcomes. So that's why we focused on this. We wanted to evaluate the sickest of the sick. This study was done in the military health system, which is a single provider system, much like the, the Veterans Administration system that Dr. Jarvis talked about. It delivers health care to 9.6 million active duty soldiers, as well as people who are on the reserves and as well as retired U.S. military personnel and their dependents. So some retired people go into the VA system. Some actually stay in the military system. It encompasses 49 uh, acute care hospitals, 32 of which are in the U.S. So a good number of these are overseas hospitals as well. So this is getting a global picture, not just the U.S., and also 465 ambulatory care clinics and occupational health centers, 373 are in the US. So again, this is a global study. The patients that we enrolled in this study were all re recorded individuals receiving healthcare within the military health system who developed a bacterial bloodstream infection between January 2010 to December 2019. Now, the reason we stopped at that date was because that was the, the time at which we had the most complete information. And you'll notice this stops right before COVID. So what we don't have right now is information, and we want to get that information in our next study. But for now, we wanted to look over the decade that preceded COVID. I, I will mention that COVID, as we all know, was a very outlier situation that hopefully we'll never experience again in our lives. So it, it's not really clear whether that information reflects what's going to continue to go on. And hopefully for some of this, it doesn't go on. Um, so what we actually did was the military has something called the Navy and Marine Corps Public Health Center, which actually has all of this information from the patients. And then we got the clinical information on patients from the military health system data repository. Next slide. So what we were able to do was collate the microbiological information with the patient information as well. So what we saw was in that decade, we there were over 8 million people who received care in the military health system. Of those people, 15,000 individuals developed 18,000 bloodstream infections. So the reason why the, the second number is bigger is some people developed more than one. And we thought this was important to distinguish because there's a difference between counting up the number of organisms be to, be, from counting up the number of people who are actually infected. So the other thing is that the military sometimes ends up taking care of people who like land in a military hospital as an emergency. So we wanted to look at people who were military health system beneficiaries in whom there was long-term follow-up data for a year. So that got us down to about 15,000 people with bloodstream infections or an average of about 18.9 of bloodstream infections per 100,000 beneficiaries per year. The majority of these people were male and that's not that surprising because the military, although it does have more women than it used to, is still a more a male predominated population. But the other interesting thing is that most of these people were older than 65 years of age. So when you think about the military, it's mostly young, healthy people. But it was really the retirees who were affected most by this. And I think that's important because we need to understand who it is who needs the help the most. And then also retired uniformed service members. And that shows that these infections are not equally distributed across young people and old people. While these infections can occur in younger people, the majority of them occurred in older folks. So, but what we also saw was that if you look across organisms, Staph aureus was the second most common infection only after E. coli, which is a common cause of urinary tract infections. Next slide. So on this pie graph that I'm gonna show you, Staph aureus is the green slice of that pie. And as you can see, it's the second biggest slice after E. coli. So of those 15,000 ep episodes of bloodstream infections, which occurred in about 12,000 people, 4,500 of them or so were due to E. coli and 3,000 of them were from Staph aureus. So no matter which way you cut this, Staph aureus comes out number two in relation to bloodstream infections. And you can see how, how the other organisms are really much smaller slices of that pie. So if you're talking about, and, and these also cause very different kinds of infections, E. coli is one that's more associated with abdominal and urinary tract infections. Staph aureus is one that's more associated with skin infections and pneumonia and some other kinds of systemic infections. Next slide. So as I said before, the kinds of people who get these are very interesting and they actually differ across organisms. So for instance, if you look at E. coli, which is a more common one, that actually occurs more often in women because women get more urinary tract infections than men do. 
But if you look at Staph aureus, you'll see here that it's occurring more commonly in people over the age of 65. 47%, almost half of those infections occurred in people over the age of 65, and 64% of them occurred in, in men. And again, that's not surprising in a military population because it's the men, especially who are in basic training or going out there crawling in the mud, and they're the ones that are getting skin infections related to this. The other thing you can notice is that many, many people had other diseases. So these were not young, healthy folks. Comorbidities or other illnesses, 51% of these people had chronic pulmonary diseases and 48% had diabetes and staph aureus. So again, the reason I'm bringing this up is when you look at the clinical trials of, of testing new drugs that look good in the test tube against staph aureus, a lot of these people are exactly the kind of folks that are excluded from the clinical research studies. Next slide. So if you look at this, you can actually see, we actually looked at the resistance profiles and in Staph aureus, the number of methicillin resistance isolates was about 36%. So about a third of these people have MRSA and the other two thirds have uh, methicillin susceptible Staph aureus. And the reason I wanna, I'm showing this is not to minimize the importance of methicillin resistance Staph aureus, but also to point out that there's still a big chunk of people who get very ill with methicillin susceptible staph aureus. Luckily, what we saw was very few people had vancomycin resistance or daptomycin resistance. And so vancomycin still remains an important mainstay of treatment, but many people who receive vancomycin, even for methicillin resistant or methicillin susceptible staph aureus, still have poor outcomes. And the idea that your fate should be determined by the susceptibility of your bug really doesn't hold water. We need to come up with better interventions that are not just dependent upon what, what the drug does in a test tube, but what the drug does for patients. Next slide. So there is some good news about this that sort of tracks with what Dr. Jarvis was showing. We looked at how many people were getting bloodstream infections over that decade. And as you can see, that green line that sits in the middle is staph aureus infections. And we actually saw a downward trend over the decade of people getting methicillin-resistant resi uh, or methicillin-susceptible staph aureus infections. An important caveat here is, again, we stopped the, the data we had stopped right before the COVID pandemic. Um, I will say one thing about that, though. When we looked at other kinds of infections, which were common in the military, say, during the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, we, at that time, also saw blips in some kinds of organisms like there's a very resistant organism called Acinetobacter. In 2001 and 2002, there were 100 people in the military that were diagnosed with that infection. Over this 10 year span, we saw nine, nine people total with that. So it's interesting when Dr. Jarvis shows these organisms about which CDC is concerned, it makes one wonder how one picks those because they're not just looking at how many people get sick, they, they are using some other judgment of what they think might happen in the future. And it's not at all clear that those organisms are gonna to continue to rise. And we, my own opinion of this, I'll just offer one, is we get way worried about what's gonna happen in the future instead of looking at these sick people with staph aureus who are right in front of us right now who need some help. Next slide. So here's the results in terms of patient outcomes. When I look at a lot of studies on antibiotic resistance, they show you how many people get infected or how much resistance is there, but what they're missing is what happens to these folks. So we wanted to make an important part of this study, how many people lived and how many died. It's very difficult to get out of medical charts anything other than this, but I want to reiterate how important it is to focus on things, not just survival, but also on things like symptoms, patients function in their daily lives, and quality of life. Obviously, we couldn't get that out of a retrospective review of medical charts, but in research studies going forwards, we absolutely should be focusing on this. As you can see, the other good news out of this is it appeared that there was a downward trend in the number of people dying from Staph aureus bloodstream infections as well. So the good news about this is that maybe some of the, the stuff that we're doing for stewardship and prevention of Staph aureus is working. The obvious question is, is the military doing what Dr. Jarvis proposed in terms of screening people and isolating them? And the answer is, I don't know. 
our current, one of the current studies we're actually doing is looking across military health facilities to see what they're actually doing and how consistent those practices are. So unlike the VA, which has a unified system of what they're telling people to do, right now we're not sure that everybody's doing the same thing in the military. So that's what our current study is doing, is evaluating what people are actually doing. But the good news out of this is something we're doing is working because it appears that the number of deaths is going down, or at least the percentage of deaths is going down. Next slide. So if you look at this, these numbers are unadjusted for severity of illness. And it, it is true that people who get infected with methicillin resistant Staph aureus tend to be older, sicker, and have more comorbid diseases than people with susceptible disease. But even so, if you look at this, the death rate with methicillin resistance is higher than it is with methicillin susceptible. The next part of the study is we're actually going to try to control for those various factors like how old people were and how sick they were, et cetera. But this still shows that both of these diseases are very important. Even if you look at methicillin susceptible step orders, one in four people die who get these infections. Next slide. So we didn't have the opportunity to look at some things that I wanna point out here in this study. One I already mentioned is bloodstream infection is only one type of infection due to Staph aureus, but it represents the most serious form of the disease. We didn't have the opportunity yet to adjust by how sick these people are because the sickest patients are most likely to have the worst outcomes. And we weren't able to look at outcomes other than survival, but clearly patient symptoms, function, and quality of life are equally important, if not more so, in survivors. Next slide. So what does this tell us? How can we take the information I just presented to you and reflect it back on what we could do to try to do better in terms of future research and improving patients' lives? Well, first of all, older and sicker patients are those who get these infections more often. And I think I showed you this data last year, a study that we did showing that of those 26 antibiotics that we, worked, that we evaluated, every single one of them excluded the sickest patients from those studies. Those are actually the people who need the most help and in whom we should be evaluating these new interventions. Staph aureus still causes a large proportion of these infections. And as Dr. Jarvis showed it on the first slide, these urgent organisms actually occur in far fewer people other than Clostridium difficile. So why isn't Staph aureus up at the top of that list? And perhaps we should be looking at overall burden of disease rather than somebody's organism du jour like Candida auris that they might be worried about. And I'm not trying to minimize the importance of those things, but if one was, for instance, in the military to develop a new drug for Acinetobacter, as we pointed out to the military brass, you'd help nine people over a decade, as opposed to if you came up with a vaccine to prevent Staph aureus infections, you'd help thousands. So the other thing is that these outcomes are affected by patients' underlying health and their immune status. It's not just about after they what they get infected with, it's who you are that matters. And the two types of groups that do that have the worst outcomes are very young children and older people. And so those are the things we should actually be focusing on. Many people, as with, with Beth's um, tale that she told us, get an antibiotic to which the organism is susceptible in the test tube, and they still have poor outcomes. Why is that? Because it's a host immune issue. It's that that person's body is not responding properly, and that therefore maybe we should look at things other than antibiotics. And one of the things that Dr. Jarvis focused on was a non-pharmacologic intervention of, say, of screening people and isolating them. What I'm talking about is pharmacologic interventions other than antibiotics. So a person whose immune system isn't reacting properly isn't going to be helped by the next organ drug that kills more bugs. They're going to need things like stuff that either prevents them from getting sick in the first place, like a vaccine, or things like host immune modifiers. And to date, we have studied several Staph aureus vaccines. None of them have been successful to date. The interesting thing to me is I always point out to people that Robert Ehrlich, who was one of the pioneers in microbiology, studied 669 compounds till he came up with one that was effective in treating syphilis. Today, the way we act is, well, we try it once, we try it twice, okay, we're done. So I often wonder if Robert Ehrlich was a modern drug developer, we never would have found anything because you need to keep at it sometimes. And sometimes you learn more from your failures than you do from your successes in terms of coming up with better interventions. The next thing we need is better outcome measures. 
and standardized patient reported outcomes that come directly from patients can accurately measure both patient symptoms and function. Right now, the way that these studies are done is the outcomes are whether your physician thinks you're doing well or not. And we have been advocating for some time that getting information directly from patients is a much better way to evaluate what's happening in their lives. Next slide. So in conclusion then, the current state of research in infectious diseases, including Staph aureus, doesn't really address the questions that need answering. What we're looking at is whether these interventions might be a little worse in the people that already have effective interventions. What we need is interventions that improve the lives of people in whom current therapies don't work. So patients, advocates, and clinicians and other stakeholders need to demand better evidence. So at this point, what we're getting is the same old, same old. These drugs come out, they don't have any benefits for people, and they charge us 10,000 bucks a pop. And the real question is, is that something we want to live with? And shouldn't we be demanding better evidence and better standards from both the FDA and better evidence from drug companies? Um, the notion of uh, there was a recent BMJ paper on the development of a new antibiotic that showed how flawed the studies were. And when they interviewed the principal investigator for the study, he said something I actually found fairly shocking. He said, well, that's just the way it is. And that's how these drugs are developed. Well, I would pose to all of us here today that that's not acceptable, that that's just the way it is, is not an acceptable answer to improve patient outcomes, and that we need to make the new therapies worth using in practice and worth paying for by actually doing the studies in a way that show they improve patients' lives. So thanks very much for inviting me. I really appreciate it to be allowed to come and speak to you again today. Well, thank you, Dr. Powers, um, for all of the wonderful information that you gave us today. Uh, we've had the excellent presentations. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Rodney Rode. He's a microbiologist, professor, and researcher from Texas State University. And he's sharing today his family's story of MRSA. Yeah, thank you, Janine. And um, I don't have a set of slides, so I'm just going to chat with you today uh, like Beth did. And and I, my heart goes out to Beth and the other folks who have, who have dealt with this in different ways. It's also an honor to be here with John and uh, Dr. Powers and, and Dr. Jarvis. Many, many of, of the papers you've written I've read. Um, let, me, let me give you a little context uh, for my story. I am an infectious disease specialist in microbiology, virology, and molecular diagnostics. So I'm a credentialed uh, medical laboratory professional who actually does the diagnostics. I, I'm not in the treatments area, even though I do work quite a bit with uh, pharmacy and physicians in this area. But I've spent about 30 years uh, in this area of my profession. And as uh, Janine mentioned, I've also done research. I've done dozens and dozens of MRSA studies in different ways. I've looked at it in people, such as nurses and physical therapists, so different types of healthcare professionals to find their colonization rates and looking at ways to prevent infections. To Dr. Power's point, I'm a huge believer in an ounce of prevention. Uh, is so, so needed in today's world. And I'm also a big uh, believer in uh, we give up too easy. Uh, one of my heroes is Edison, as well as Pasteur. I worked with rabies for many years, and the old school scientists spent way more time uh, through trial and error working around these types of issues. And I think we are in a fast food society sometimes, even in science. So I, I actually applaud that statement, Dr. Powers. But so I've been doing this uh, for a long time. And, and what you'll find when you look in in the general population, and by the way, in the environment. So I want to talk a little bit about the environment. The environment is a living thing with respect to the healthcare environment, with respect to the community environment, and what's on surfaces, for example, whether it's biofilm or actual uh, pathogens that are on surfaces. So I'm going to mention that too as well tonight in my story. Uh, but to kind of pull this together, uh, when I left uh, the Department of Health in Texas, and, and I worked a little bit as a visiting scientist at CDC as well, mostly in virology and rabies control and things like that, I went into academia and I went to Texas State, as Janine mentioned, and I started my uh, tenure track there as an assistant professor in the medical lab science program at Texas State College of Health Professions. And so like any 
new tenure track professor, I had to get a research agenda going. And so I couldn't work with rabies there. They didn't have the proper facilities. So I moved to antibiotic resistant pathogens. And MRSA was kind of the uh, the the bug of study. Uh, this was back in early 2000s. And so I started working with that, again, with colleagues from CDC and the Department of Health in Texas. And so that's what I focused on. And so as I was doing that over my career, this is where all those studies were coming from that, that um, I mentioned earlier, um, not only in people, but in animals. I've done studies in dogs. I've done studies so looking at the oral and nasal floor of pets, domestic pets. I've done studies in uh, the environment, as I mentioned, everywhere from dormitories to prisons to rec centers. And I'll tell you, almost almost just eerie uh, how common Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus is in those types of populations. So if you take a group of people and there were 100 people and you did a nasal swab and you did the microbiology identification of that, and about 30% of people, plus or minus a couple of percentage points, 30% of us in that 100 would be carrying, colonized with Staph aureus in our nasal nares. If you did the same study and looked for MRSA, which is a resistant form of Staph aureus to many antibiotics, one to two, maybe one to three of you would have that. So 1%, maybe up to 3%. And so to hear Beth's story about four or five people in her family, that that is that is quite shocking uh, that you had that many people. Although if you were living in the same environment, you know, that makes sense with that particular situation. Okay, so that's that's my world professionally. And so that's what I've been doing for 20, 30 years now. But what became really um, personal to me is right around 2010, um, maybe a little earlier than that, uh, my dad retired from the uh, railroad. My dad worked for the MKT and the UP Railroad for over 30 years. And back then, you jumped on and off trains uh, with no with no caution for your own safety. And so he really, uh, over 35 years of his career, really hammered his knees and his ankles. And if you think about, if you ever looked at a train track, there's rock that's kind of at an angle Pretty, pretty steep angle. And so he was a conductor. He rode cabooses back when they were on the back of the train and he would walk. You had to walk trains to check for the brakes and to check for other issues along the train. So over 35 years or so, he just wore out his ankles and knees. So right as he was retiring, uh, he had to have a knee replacement and he had to have a lot of, a lot of things with one of his foot done where he has a lot of um, screws and pins in his ankle and things like that to hold it all together. Soon after, uh, he developed uh, a, a bloodstream infection first, and then he started showing up with a lot of colonization of MRSA. And and as you know, as the son in the family that actually knows about this stuff, I was at every appointment. I was in every hospital room. He's 81 now, going on 82, and so he's lived with this. It hasn't killed him yet, uh, but he has gone through sepsis from a UTI. He has gone through, you know, the the agonizing decision to whether or not he wants to get his knee taken apart and redone. And at this point, at his age and and some of the things he's dealing with, the, the doctors have just decided not to mess with that. But it's a constant uh, fear and concern with him and my mother, who's about seventy eight. And so that personal piece uh, really made this uh, something that I was passionate about, uh, really middle of my career. Alongside this time in um, around 2006, I decided, you know, I need I need to do more. I need to learn more about how people understand it and how we deal with antibiotic resistant infections like MRSA. So uh, I decided to go back and get my doctorate, my Ph.D. And what I did is I did it in uh, public health and adult learning. And so I'm a bench level scientist. I mean, I've done all the the wet lab research that that's been a part of my career my whole life. But in the middle of my career, this was really transformational for me because of my dad and because of other people that I knew were suffering from MRSA, I decided to go this route. And so program that I went into was really about education of adults, public health, but I got to choose and direct my own dissertation, my own research project. And so I was so informed now about the science behind MRSA is that what I really wanted to dig into were people's and patients' 
uh, experiences with MRSA. So my entire PhD dissertation for a couple of years was what you call qualitative research, which is patient stories, looking at artifacts, looking at um, different things. And really the focus of my study was on individuals who had survived a MRSA diagnosis. Uh, and so I, I interviewed uh, about 16 people from all over the country. And ultimately uh, what that study kind of got into, um, and it's really was looking at a model of learning and adaptation in the general public. And this is this is really done in the sense that you're interviewing people and then you look for themes. And what I was trying to find out were gaps in learning and really understanding what they were coming from. So individuals here with us tonight, like like Beth and Amanda coming coming up soon, was that what I learned was from these patients and really uh, some of the main categories um, that I looked at was learning. And in learning, I really looked at how individuals used their experience with MRSA to kind of answer the questions like what was learned and how did learning occur? And then the other part of that study uh, was adaptation. So how did you adapt to that situation, whether it was ultimately deadly to someone you loved or was it you know, severely impactful to your ability to work or, or emotionally or whatever it was. And it really gave me some insights into self-reliance and how people relied on each other and, and those sorts of things. And so there is so much uh, to kind of bring out in that. I developed a common model of MRSA learning and adaptation and how people kind of self-direct their learning. And one of the most impactful quotes, uh, and Beth had quite a few in her story, but uh, and I use this sometimes when I talk about MRSA, was almost to a person, and I've talked to just um, hundreds at this point uh, about their story. Even today in 2023, people will still tell me, and it's in some form or fashion, like, you know, Dr. Rohde, sometimes you just don't know what questions to ask. So what, I, what do I mean by that? I mean that many people in the general public uh, don't, again, to Dr. Power's point, don't understand what an antibiotic-resistant infection is. They don't really understand the sometimes the, the data and the science that we throw at people. And so my focus in the last five to 10 years has been to sometimes back away from hammering people with um, what I used to do all the time, which was dig into the science and talk about the susceptibility testing and talk about uh, how you identify Staph aureus. And, and it's all critically important, as Dr. Powers and Dr. Jarvis said. I'm not, I'm not putting that too far away from what I do. But what I'm saying here is that science communication and health literacy are such a needed component in today's society. I mean, if COVID has not shown us anything, it is it has really shown us how so many people uh, not only misunderstand things, but then share improper or sometimes outright false information, whether it's about an antibiotic, whether it's about some supplement, whether it's about a vaccine, whether it's about a mask. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And so that's kind of become my rallying cry as a researcher and advocate. And it's why I was so excited that Beth uh, invited me, I'm sorry, Janine invited me to come and speak with uh, this, this group tonight, because it's really an area I think that needs to be, need to be studied. I, one, one of the things I'll kind of wrap up with, um, again, a lot, of, a lot of things have been thrown at you tonight statistically, but to put this maybe in a little bit more perspective for you, all the way back in the early 2000s, so this was some of the literature review I did with my work. As far back as the early 2000s, MRSA back then killed more people in the USA annually than HIV AIDS. And so that, that always makes me take a moment, just kind of take a pause, because when you fast forward up to 2022, certainly COVID has had a, a huge impact on um, the rebound, if you will, of, of MRSA and MSSA, and really on the full-blown uh, cadre of pathogens that are resistant to uh, different antibiotics and different drugs. 
And it's not just bacteria. You know, there are viral resistance, there's fungal resistance and many other things. But in, in some of the studies that have been done recently, right after, or, you know, right as we're kind of winding down for COVID, uh, one particular study that looked at 23 pathogens, um, drug resistance in only six of those. So if you picked out this, the main six, E. coli was number one, Staph aureus was number two, and then just so you know, Klebsiella pneumonia, Strep pneumonia, Acinobacter, which the gentleman spoke about earlier, and Pseudomonas, those six alone led directly to almost 1 million deaths and was associated with 3.57 million suspected deaths. So again, that's that's complications from other types of things going on. And if you looked at only staff, if you looked at only MRSA, that one bug, and this goes, goes to, to uh, Dr. Power's point as well, it caused more than 100,000 deaths in 2020. And so if you do the math, um, I do this sometimes when I'm talking about this bug. If you do the math, um, 365 days a year, um, over 100,000 deaths a year, you're looking at about 150 people a day in this country. That's, that's crazy. That, that's phenomenal. That means every time you get up in the morning, 150 more people are going to die from MRSA. I mean... I don't know if that bothers you at all, but I, I mean, when I think about that each day, that's like a small plane that's crashing. And, and certainly if a plane was crashing every day in this country or even another country, you would hope that something would be done about it. And so, you know, that's just just one quick way to think about it is how many daily people are suffering and dying from this death. And then globally, I'll kind of end with this to, again to put some numbers on this. The uh, World Economic Forum, which does these massive studies of different things like cancer, HIV, and malaria, and other types of impacts of disease, it's roughly been stated statistically with different studies that by 2050, so 25 years or so from now, if nothing's done to slow this onward march of MRSA and really all antimicrobial resistance, we're going to see 10 million deaths a year, and we're going to see three somewhere in the range of three hundred billion to up to a trillion dollars in economic impact. So that's where we're headed. It will surpass cancer as the number one killer uh, if we keep on this march. So, thank you again, Janine, and thank you to Pat and to all of my esteemed panel that are here today. I really appreciate your efforts, and your um, your advocacy, and passion for raising awareness about not just MRSA, but the entire problem of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rode, for your excellent um, presentation and sharing your personal story. Uh, Ms. Pat Merriweather Argus, my co-chair of World Wars Day for the past 15 years, is an executive director of the project Patient Care, and she will share some data and some MRSA um, patient safety information. Pat? Thank you, Janine. And thank you to all the presenters tonight. I, I think it's been uh, amazing to hear the opportunities that we have ahead of us, as well as some of the challenges. And I agree, sometimes we focus um, too often on the processes and not enough on the outcomes. And um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is uh, you know, when you have MRSA, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, and, and you get cleared from MRSA, it doesn't mean that um, you're home free. And it's the same thing with any type of infection. And that's why it's so important to, if you're in a healthcare setting, to work to avoid having a healthcare infection. You know, um, sometimes patients put up signage about washing their hands or somebody's monitoring them, a, a family member or a caregiver, to make sure people are washing their hands and, and doing the proper protocols. But it's really critical that, again, if you can avoid getting an infection in a healthcare setting, um, as well as the community setting too, you know, back to the basics of washing your hands and, you know, keeping 
things clean, um, you can avoid what we sometimes uh, think of as a very deadly condition, and that's sepsis. And the reason I want to bring it up is because, you know, you could you could be home for a week or two, and then all of a sudden start feeling bad, um, not feeling as healthy as you were before. You can become disoriented. And uh, you can lapse into sepsis. And uh, sepsis is a condition. It is it is pretty much avoidable. Um, again, if you don't get an infection or you're monitoring the condition. And uh, it's one of those that people just think they're going into a relapse of maybe the condition that they had and they don't seek immediate treatment. And so about 1.7 million adults in America will develop sepsis. Um, and the mortality rate is quite high for uh, sepsis. And that's, um, again, uh, developing sepsis and dying during their hospitalization. And one in three people who dies in a hospital, now think about this, had sepsis during that hospitalization. And so it's really important for, again, uh, you to take care of yourself and certainly at signs or symptoms of sepsis to seek immediate treatment. It is, um, there's some risk factors here of 65 and older, people with chronic medical conditions. Um, and again, we learned that they're also more susceptible to infections as well. Uh, people who survive sepsis are also still susceptible to sepsis. Uh, weakened immune systems, severe illness or hospitalization, and children under one. And the one thing is you can you can save your life if you or a loved one's life, if they start having these symptoms that they can get immediate can, uh, treatment. And this is where it's called time. So that your temperature is is very different. It's higher or lower than what usually it is. You have had an infection. And what people forget is uh, you know, MRSA's an infection, C. diff's an infection, um, a urinary tract infection, uh, a flu, COVID. Any of those are infections. And then you start to have a little bit of confusion. You may be sleepy. You may uh, actually be difficult to rouse up, to get up, and then you start feeling extremely ill. It's really important you get to a hospital and to the emergency room and just say, can this be sepsis? Because that's a trigger for a hospital to say, oh my gosh, we've got to really assess the condition right away. And they will take your you in right away and uh, do a workup. The the thing that's challenging with sepsis is people don't think a cold is an infection or a, a the flu or COVID. They don't think of it that same way as a hospital acquired infection or somebody that's in the hospital and then is discharged saying, hey, you know, you you no longer have an infection. Again, these symptoms uh, really trigger that you could be going into sepsis. And we hear about septic shock. Now, I remember when I first met Janine Thomas and uh, we were talking about uh, the legislation for MRSA. And uh, she looked at me and she said, well, Pat, these infections, MRSA infections are preventable. You know, it's, it's uh, the, of course, the, the clean hands, the clean environment, but also doing an assessment too, you know, doing the nasal swab and, and doing the testing that you can really um, prevent somebody from getting an infection. When I was in healthcare, when I started out about 30 years ago, everyone just said, oh, infections just happen. It's one of those things that, you know, you just get an infection. Uh, and it used to be masked in the word nosocomial infection. So sometimes people would say, well, you know, they have a nosocomial infection. And I would say, well, what type of infection? And they're like, nosocomial. Well, that means healthcare acquired infection. So I think there's uh, the same thing with sepsis. We 
is sometimes people say they died of septic shock. Well, again, we can avoid that. But again, the best thing is to avoid getting MRSA uh, or spreading MRSA uh, if you have it and spreading it to others, uh, but also making sure that you're on the alert. Even though you've gone home, you think you're doing well, and then you start to feel sick again, it's the time to really seek treatment. If you get to treatment and they're trying to reduce the amount of time when you enter a hospital so that it could be within three hours, you get the full battery of treatment, it can save your life. It can save the loved one's life. So again, that's my message for today is, you know, I, I used to not think that uh, hospital acquired infections were preventable. Now I believe they're almost all preventable. And the same thing with sepsis. Uh, we can prevent sepsis as well. And certainly we can prevent people from dying of septic shock by taking the necessary precautionary steps. So with that, again, it's been great to be with everyone tonight. And I always enjoy the energy of Janine because uh, she keeps us all on our toes. But I'm now going to turn it back over to Amanda. Um, I'd like to introduce Amanda. Um, she's from Ontario, Canada, and she's sharing her personal story tonight uh, about her MRSA infection. And she does have a Facebook page uh, for MRSA survivors to talk about. And so we're happy to have her join us tonight. Amanda. Hi, everybody, and thank you for having me. Is my camera working for everybody? Can anybody hear me? Hello? Your voice is very faint. If you can get closer to the mic or increase the mic. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Hi. Can you guys see me? Hello? Go ahead and speak, okay. Amanda. Go ahead and speak. Can you hear me? I'm having a hard time connecting. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody, and thank you for having me. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your stories. And Beth, I am so sorry for your loss. Um, that's very, very sad to hear. So um, thank you for having me and for, for being present and sharing your your stories and all the information that I have picked up today with my group. Um, also for allowing me to share my continuous battle with what I call the devil, um, MRSA. Imagine being a young, healthy, shy of 35-year-old female one day to being on complete bed rest the next. From starting out with what you thought was a small pimple to an abscess that debilitates you to the point that you cannot move that body part at all. Also, other times you have spots showing up on multiple parts of your body which your body is completely demanding bed rest and medical attention. Now what used to be an active, happy, fulfilling life has now become a daily struggle to be active and be able to do daily tasks. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Juby and I'm from Niagara Falls, Canada. I'm a proud mother of four beautiful active children, ages 11, 13, 14, and 16, who I'm very grateful I did not pass this too. And here's my story. On August 2021, I was camping in Cohill, Ontario, and I was bit by a brown recluse spider in my groin, groin area while getting dressed. They are known to be venomous spiders. I immediately required emergency surgery three days later to remove a massive infection from below my groin to under my breast. I now had a huge scar in most of my body. I left the hospital on antibiotics, narcotic painkillers as strong as ketamine, gravel, sleeping pills, Tylenol, and stool softeners. Five days later, after the surgery, I would re require what would be a second surgery to remove more infection as the first doctor had inserted gauze in my body with no drainage occurring. The gauze had to be removed. I then had many drain drainage tubes inserted. Even while still being on multiple antibiotics, they didn't seem to be effective to reduce any of the infection or rid of the infection. By this time, I was sepsis and it was in my blood. The doctor had said I had legally died twice during surgery. That same doctor who took care of me 
told my mom that he had to vacuum me out, scrape my stomach, my hip, my groin, my upper thigh, and my leg. This is after stating that he almost wanted to take the left leg. After trying to recuperate at home, mysteriously following these surgeries, large painful abscesses were starting to appear on many parts of my body. After that, I returned several times to the hospital to try and combat this infection, not just two hospitals in my region, but out of the region as well, as far as three hours away from me. Fast forward another several more weeks on complete bed rest with the care of my mother around the clock and home care nurses coming twice a day. I was not being informed by anyone at this time to what was really happening to my body. Yet again, I was put on IV and oral antibiotics. When I was sent home, I continued to get these large abscesses on my arms, my buttocks, inside my nose, in my eyes, my vagina, my bladder, my urine, my kidneys, and on my face. I was getting very scared and anxious. I was in a great, great deal of pain once again. I was losing a great deal of sleep. I continued to be very weak. For a small person already of 120 pounds, I was now down to 80 pounds, and I wasn't eating. I ended up back in a wheelchair as I couldn't walk. Many, many times I would cry because of not knowing what was going on and why I was in this pain. A wonderful nurse, when I had returned to the hospital for a visit for an abscess on my arm, asked me if I had MRSA. I did not know what that was at the time, and the look on her face did not seem very good to me. She left and returned with a saddened look on her face. She then told me she looked at my file, and then she delivered the news to me that I had MRSA. The only thing that she told me upon discharge was to make sure that all the sores were covered, which, after doing my research, a lot more than just the sores and abscesses had to be covered. I was distraught as I had no idea what it was. I had not been told by anyone up to this moment. I had been in debilitating pain with this condition as well. I returned home. I had large, large abscesses on my buttocks at this point, requiring another surgery to insert another drainage tube for a total of six now. Now more bed rest and home care for me. Not to mention, I passed it to my significant other, who was helping me with the bandages at the time before I had been diagnosed with MRSA. No one told me I had MRSA upon release of the hospital, not ever once of, of any visit. The first set of home care nurses also not aware, which were a set of eight in rotation of five weeks, had no idea, leaving my house traveling to other patients around. This now meant that I would still be living in my mom's house under her care. I was now not working or going to school. I was suffering from medical PSD, PD, depression from vicious never ending cycle of infection while still receiving prescription antibiotics that seemed useless to take as they clearly were not working for me. At this point too, I had sent my four children to their father's house as I was extremely scared that they would pick this up. So now my family was split apart. After being cultured, I found out that I was resistant to all but one antibiotic. That was not something that anyone wants to hear and that was super scary. I then realized research on my own to combat MRSA inside and out. It was detrimental to my future health. Through this research, I found out taking large doses of raw cut garlic, sorry, oregano oil capsules, and Clyde silver orally and topically, teacher oil body washes, <clears throat> iodine, um, and take out probiotics to improve my gut aura started to help. These helped me significantly to uh, temporarily clear the MRSA and have improved my quality of life by a little. Over a span of a year, my children have suffered and I've had a very sick mother. I had to slowly learn how to walk again and had a lot of pain and scarring. I was very depressed and suffering from a lot of medical PSTD because of extreme amount of pain I experienced on a daily basis. I still had no active life and no life in me. These natural remedies have helped me tremendously and have improved my quality of life. I'm not 100% and a face the fact I no longer will be. I learned to accept this, although hard. People in hospitals need to know that this is a serious condition that needs to be addressed now and is a condition that has a fatal result if not treated. I'm also very thankful for the Facebook group that we communicate every day on a regular basis to help with PSD, not just for myself, but others that are suffering. I'm now an admin of this group with over 4,000 people worldwide suffering hopelessly. This group has been a great deal of support for MRSA sufferers. I hope that today you can take with you knowledge that helps others that are suffering. MRSA is pure evil. MRSA is not a joke. It's not to be taken lightly. It's a beast of a bacteria that can change your life forever. In a split second, 
especially if you caught it in the wrong spot. Hospitals, doctors, and society, they're not doing enough to make sure that it doesn't spread in the community, which is starting to spread at an alarming rate, and it's very scary. So I appreciate you taking your time to hear my story today, and I appreciate you guys all for being here and sharing your information as well. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing your personal story. I, I know it's not easy, and it's very courageous of you because your story helps other people. We're now, go now going to show an AR AMR video. Uh, the video is on antimicrobial resistance, and this was given to, uh, to us to um, use from, my, from our alliance partner in the UK, MRSA Action UK, which is Derek Butler and um, Maria Khan, and she's on uh, to watching today. So we'll watch the video. Thank you. My first encounter with um, antimicrobial resistance was in 2004 when my mum was being treated for cancer. Um, the surgery went extremely well. Within two days, she started with sort of rigors and being very sick and was very ill and was told she had an infection. She was actually being treated with the drug of ancomycin. So I came home and I did a bit of research and that's when I found out it was the drug of last resort for MRSA. My mum's condition got worse. She was in hospital with the infection for about six weeks and she ended up passing away at home. But we researched her red medical records after she'd passed away and we did actually find that the wound um, that was infected was actually still colonized with MRSA when she left the hospital. It wasn't my first encounter with infection, however. Um, 34 years ago, I lost my daughter to um, pseudom pseudomonas meningitis. She was only two weeks old and uh, we just left hospital, even though she was got, got to hospital quickly to treat it. Um, she didn't respond to the antibiotics and she didn't make it, unfortunately. I've lost three family members to bacteria that have been resistant to antibiotics. My stepfather, my grandfather and my uncle. What happened to my stepfather was that he had a massive heart attack and he was rushed into our local hospital and he was treated quite well at first. And they moved him on to a general ward after about 14 days and he picked up an infection. The bacteria did not respond to any form of treatment. Everything they threw at it, it just beat the antibiotic until eventually he died 15 weeks later from what they call organ failure, all because we'd lost the battle against the bacteria. We could not treat it. Nothing matters until it becomes personal. Now, before my stepfather died, antimicrobial resistance and MRSA were somebody else's problem. Losing a loved one made it my problem. And it helped me form the charity, MRSA Action UK. We're never going to stop all infections. That's impossible. There's bacteria all over. But we can make the majority of avoidable infections avoidable. And until we do that, I will not rest. This is an issue far greater than climate change. Antimicrobial resistance will affect every person on the planet. Modern healthcare systems now are underpinned by the use of antibiotics. What I'm trying to say is, is that without antibiotics, modern healthcare as we know it today would not be able to function. I hope that the, the warnings are going to be heeded about antimicrobial resistance and everybody does understand that they've got a role to play in preserving antibiotics. As far as my granddaughter and my grandson are concerned, I want them to live in a world where antibiotics will work and simple illnesses can be treated. And if they need more complex surgery, they've got the best chance of surviving that. Um, in closing, I, I would like to thank my co-chair of 15 years, Pat Merriweather Argus, Dr. Jarvis, Dr. Powers, Dr. Rode, um, Beth Bias, Amanda Juby, and Tumors Action UK for providing the AMR video. Um,
Derek Butler and Maria Khan. Thank you for listening tonight. And I hope that you have learned some great things from uh, tonight's event. And this is the 15th year and we hope we have 15 more years. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Janine, for all that you've done to advance this in the United States and spreading it uh, with other countries collaborating. It, it really was uh, your unending, um, you know, your unending push to make things happen and to get it recognized and on the radar. Um, I, I can remember uh, those battles with the clinicians on whether MRSA could be prevented or not. Um, and even if patients should be told, as Amanda had said, that she had MRSA, that, that was very common is not to tell a patient except to say you have a nosocomial infection. So again, thank you, 15 years. Um, I'm looking forward to the next 15 years and hopefully we'll be talking about how everyone now is testing and screening for uh, MRSA as well as the numbers are plummeting. Um, as Dr. Jarvis said they were at one time, uh, we can make that happen again. So thank you, Janine and everyone on this webinar tonight. Thank you, Pat. Thank you very much. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, thank Maria, for all the work that you and Derek do. Yeah, well, thank you. Oh, there's Derek. Derek. Hey, Janine, I've been listening. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've been listening, Lily. It's uh, very good. I have sent you an email. Okay. Um, have a look at it when you have time. Uh, but well done. Well done. Thank you. It's great next to see time, you. Next time I will have some input. Okay. All right. Thank All you right. so much. My alliance partners since for many years. Thank you. You'll have to excuse how we look. It is uh, 3 o'clock. 2.45 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for staying with shift. us. <laughs> I haven't done a night shift for 40 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, well done, Jane. Well done. Right. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank bye. you. Okay. Are we all good here?